do you mind double checking Sith because I can't actually pull chat up right now we'll take all the questions at the end um, I'm sure they're probably gonna be a handful because it's gonna be quite information dense and um, we're gonna have two examples that go quite in depth on history and um, some smaller examples as well uh, uh, Bur yeah. uh, Bursa says ready to roll we're good. Ready to roll? Perfect. All right. So if we're ready to roll, I'll go ahead and start it up. Welcome, everybody. Today is Thursday, September 14th, and we will be talking about world building culture and politics today. We're going to take a very specific approach, one that I've found useful, but again, this is not comprehensive. This is a method that works for me because of my specific interests, because I have, I mean, a specific background. Um, and... Uh, it's just a method that will help you guys. Maybe it'll get you guys thinking about how you want to do world building, how you want to think about cultures and your world's history. So let's get started. All right. So world building, culture, and politics. This is a rabbit hole, a rabbit hole of a rabbit hole. There are so many different ways to think about history. I mean, there are entire fields of science and anthropology and um, sociology that deal with this sort of topic. What makes a culture the way it is? What are the defining aspects of some cultures? Um, and how do people act within that culture? How do they act on the outside of it? How is it viewed by the people in its area? So many different questions that we can go into and that people have, I mean, quite literally written um, doctorates, like PhD theses about. Um, so we're going to try to at least take a singular footstep into this world and see how it can help us be better writers when it comes to creating fictional worlds. So I want to bring up an idea called historical materialism. And if you guys um, get a little bit lost in this concept, it's actually a pretty simple one. And please bear with me. I will wheel back to how this applies to writing and world building right after. Okay. So Let's get a little bit academic in here. Let's talk about this concept of historical materialism. If you guys um, uh, don't look too much into who <laughs> who came up with historical materialism, because it is um, you know Marx and Engels, but uh, the idea is that this is a theory that postulates that all institutions of human society, including government and religion, are the outgrowth of its economic activity. It seems like a complex idea, especially with addiction that the definition here uses. Um, long story short, the materials, the things within a society that the people who are there commonly interact with affect how they make their society. It's pretty simple, right? For example, if, if there's a lot of clay in the area and all the clay is red, then and there's very rare instances of white clay and it's very special to them the white clay is very special maybe the gods like white clay so they made it rare right that's a very very basic example and we're going to use this concept to tackle how societies define themselves how uh societies are affected by their environments by their economy and how that trickles down all the way into institutions and individual behaviors of people. Again, this is a very academic concept. Um, it's one that, you know, like I said, people have PhD theses about. <clears throat> but we're going to see how it applies to your writing. So here is a more in-depth example. We love talking about Egyptian mythology. Um, I'm not sure if you guys have dove into it too much. Um, I have a little bit. But... Mythology aside, let's get one fact straight, and this is a fact, about Egyptian civilization. The Nile River regularly floods between the months of June and September, <clears throat> inundating the valley and providing nutrients to farmlands. This is how the Egyptians came to live in the same place. You live in a desert, and it's like, well, I can't farm in the sand. Where can I farm? Oh, wow. Wait a second. Every year this river floods. And if you plant some stuff right before it floods, then the nutrients all trickle down into the soil. 
and the soil is fertile. So if we all make farms here and we plant our grains, then we can harvest it next month. And we have so much food. We have so much food that not everyone has to hunt and farm. We have so much food that we can give food to people who can write, who can build, who can rule. And that's how the Egyptian civilization began. Is everyone still following? Can I get a vibe check from, from you, Sith? I'm, again, I can't really alt tab to look at Discord at the moment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Following yeah. along good. I think, uh, yeah, yeah. Vibe check is high from uh, Kid Kazari. Awesome. Thank you. <clears throat> So if we're, all, if we're all on the same page here, let's think about how that can affect the way of thinking of the Egyptian people. Remember, the Nile River regularly floods. And it gives life and fertility and food to people. So how does that influence what they believe? The Egyptian gods are generally orderly performing celestial duties cyclically, uh, annually, and characterized as kind, just rulers of the world. Osiris, Anubis, Isis. Pictured on the right is Hopi. Hopi is the god who um, brings the Nile flood to give fertility to the land, which feeds the Egyptian people. It just makes sense, right? The things that happen in the environment, the ways that the civilization begins, gives life to the ideas of the people. What is important to me as an Egyptian farmer in like three or in like, uh, uh, I guess, like 5000 BCE? What is important to me? What's important is the Nile comes this year and I have a bountiful harvest so that my son, who I sent off to Cairo, to learn how to write hieroglyph can also be fed, right? That is what's important to my life. And so I will praise the gods for allowing me to have this, right? So that is what is important to these people. And they created their religion around it. Next step, we talked about religion. What's the other thing that is incredibly important to the civilization? Well, when you have a lot of people in the same place, someone has got to make the decisions. And that's what politics are. So how does the Nile River flooding influence politics? Right? They seem kind of different. What does it have to do? I mean, the ruler doesn't have anything to do with... Um, they, they're, they're not causing the Nile to flood. They're not deciding that the Nile shall flood this year. Well... Maybe the ruler says that they do. The Egyptian pharaoh's rule is justified by their connection to these gods. Pharaohs were sons of Ra, sons of the sun, right? Acting as orderly, kind, just rulers in their place. These pharaohs are worldly agents of the gods, and so they must act like the gods. How do the gods act? They act orderly, kind, just. They do their job every year so that humans may have their bountiful harvest. And so, why are these gods like that? Because the Nile is like that. Not all rivers are like that, guys. Not all rivers flood annually, very calmly, and then give life to the farmlands around it. There are a lot of um, societies that don't have that sort of thing and they don't all have gods just like the Egyptians guys let's look at some other cultures just real quick the it's the gods of um, Egypt are very much so different from the constantly vengeful and warring gods of Norse mythology why do you think that might be guys why do you think Norse gods might be a little bit more um vengeful and warring right is there anything in the about the geography or the ecology of being scandinavian that might make the gods a little bit more angry any anything from the audience if just let me know um, vikings vikings right a lot of the money making a lot of the economy of scandinavia had to do 
with going somewhere else, stabbing a couple people, and taking their food. So if that's good, if that feeds my family, if that's something that I should do as the head of the household, then maybe the gods do the same thing. Right? And then Greek. Greek gods. They have a lot of bickering fam family rivalries. Is there maybe something about Greek society that makes them seem like a family that is a little bit different from each other, but and they all have rivalries, but they're all one family? What do you guys think about that? Anything off the top of your head, audience? Seth, what do you think? <clears throat> I think, uh, sorry, I'm not able to look at the chat right now, but uh, I mean, if Greece is a bunch of islands that are close to each other, that all have their own political structures and all have their own citizens, well, maybe the gods are kind of just like the islands, right? They're all close to each other. They're all part of the same family. But the people on one island might believe in one god, and they might want to do one thing. And the people of the island next to them might believe in another god that might want to do a different thing. And they might be rival islands, just like the gods might be rival family members. Right? So we can see that the environment, the materials, the economy of these peoples define religion, politics, ideals, morals, culture. That's what historical materialism means, guys. The materials of a culture define its institutions. So in summation, with our Egypt idea, our Egypt example, the pattern of flooding in the Nile affected Egyptian religion, which affected Egyptian politics. So, you guys might have the question of, well, what does this have to do with writing? So our next slide says, Eli, what's the point of all this? Specifically, when it comes to me world building a culture, there are generally two techniques when it comes to doing it. One, you have effect first. You start with some sort of detail about the culture, and then you extrapolate the history of this all the way back until you find the materialistic cause. Example. Let's say in my story, I want my pharaohs to be kind and orderly rulers. How can we explain this? Well, maybe they're justified their rule because of the gods, which are kind and orderly too. How do we justify that? Maybe the river that gave life to the civilization was also predictable and not destructive. It was orderly. So they made the gods like that. So they made the rulers like that. Right? We're starting with this idea of the pharaohs. We're starting this idea of the rulers. The second method here is cause first. You start with some sort of materialistic cause and extrapolate the effects that your culture may generate as a result. This is particularly useful when in your story, it's maybe a post-apocalypse. There's some sort of apocalyptic event or there's some sort of event that always gets mentioned in the, the history or the, um, I guess, word of mouth of characters in your story. Something like the earthquake or the crash, the market crash, or something like that. Those are usually materialistic causes. The example that we gave with the Egypt example is that the river of the civilization was predictable and not destructive. That's what I'm writing to, to be the cause. So how can this affect the religion? Well, the gods are also kind and orderly, just like the river. And so the rulers... Act, who act as the mouthpiece of the gods must appear kind and orderly too. You see, you notice how in this method we're starting with this idea that the river does one thing. So how does the people who survive off that river act and believe? Are we all, are we all Gucci? Are we all on the same page here? I think so. Uh, I think so. Awesome, awesome. If there are any questions from the audience, feel free to interrupt me, Seth. Um, I can. Um, oh yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, AO Universal said uh, it's all about the roots. So, like the real roots, including whatever reason or cause that forced, or maybe people came together in the first place, 
Am I right? Yeah, that's, I mean, that's a good way to put it. Uh, in a lot of ways, you can look at, I mean, um, we're going to talk about other societies and other aspects of culture in a little bit. Things that you might not expect off the top of your head are connected, actually are connected. But um, later, we're going to talk about the example of Judaism a little bit. Um, n notice how uh, sometimes it can even be the thing that keeps these people together, even though they are separated. Um, Judaism is, is an example of a peoples who have been diasporated, who uh, exist over many civilizations over a long span of time. Um, but they have the same identity. How do they have the same identity? How do they believe in the same religion? Because their religion and their way of life, their cultural and ethnic identity, is designed in such a way so that you can recognize if you're in Germany and and you're Jewish, and you go to Japan, and you see someone else who's Jewish, you can recognize that you're both Jewish. So, yeah, it comes from a lot of things. It can literally come from anything. You can start with whatever seed or root you want it to. And then you use that to talk about how do people, how does this affect how people believe? How does this affect how people come together? How does this affect how people hate each other? And that's kind of the story of history, isn't it, guys? So I think it helps a lot when it comes to writing your story's history. That's what world building is, right? Writing a fictional history for the world. Um, of course, we've talked on end a lot of the times about how uh, a lot of this history has to go unsaid, about how to exposit this history in an interesting way. Please, even though you make and put so much effort into history like this, like I do, um, don't just try to show it off in the first chapter, okay? <laughs> Be very clever about how you put this stuff in your world um, and how you show it off. Even, I mean, I know I want to, so I'm sure you guys want to show it off too, right? So um, just be, be very clever about that. Refer to other lectures that we've talked about how to do exposition, how to explain your world, and how to f make it feel lived in. Uh, you can see other lectures for that. But for this one today, we're just talking about how to write the history and what ideas you'd want to have in your head. Um, this is my method. It's not comprehensive. So I just want to warn you guys again. This is how I think about things. I'm a, a political science graduate. So this is kind of my wheelhouse. Um, I have a lot of fun doing it. Um, so that's just my thing. But I think that I want to show you guys my method so that it gets you thinking on how your method works. What, what is fun for you? So let's keep going. I have another slide. So this example is pretty interesting. I found, uh, I mean, I actually took a course on this concept, property rights and sexuality. Um, we're not going to go very in depth about either. Uh, but the concept here is that it's two things that you really don't think matter to each other. What does sexuality have to do with male primogen primogeniture? Well, let's go into it. So first point here, I want to define you guys. What is male primogeniture? Well, it's the idea that the eldest living son inherits the entirety of his parents' estate. A daughter could inherit if and only if she has no living brothers or the descendants of deceased brothers. So there are a couple places you could find yourselves in if this is how property rights work in your world. Let's say you're the father and you're going to die. You're on your deathbed and you have to decide who all the money and power and land you've amassed goes to. You pick your eldest son. But what if your eldest son gets murdered? Does it go to your daughter? Your whole life you've spent training this son to command armies and manage your vast wealth. But you don't. You haven't done that to your daughter. You taught your daughter how to play nice and wear dresses. That's a problem right that affects dynasties england created a new church because the king couldn't have a son this affects history and it's an idea that's very common especially in the west why is it common in the west well let's think about this a little bit it's quite common in history and why and let's talk about rome a little bit while Roman inheritance law did not specify that males specifically should inherit an estate, Roman culture was quite patriarchal in nature, with fathers being the head of the household. Julius Caesar made the decisions about the Julius household. 
right? He decided who his heir would be, and he decided his heir would be a son just like he, he is a man, so that he could be the father of his household. So it's kind of de facto male primogeniture, right? Um, and let's talk a little bit about Judaism. The firstborn son in Judaism receives a double portion of the inheritance. Um, it's not exactly male primogeniture, but it, sh it goes to show that males are preferred as the head of a household. And what does this have to do with um, why in the West we prefer sons to be our heirs? Well, a little thing happened. In the intersection of Christianity and Judaism, a place called Jerusalem uh, began a religion called Christianity. And Christianity, therefore, places much emphasis on monogamy and chastity. It would be pretty difficult to deal with ancient property law without the existence of paternity tests, right? If, um, um, you know, I didn't have any sons and instead my inheritance goes to my oldest daughter, uh, but we are not sure who the father of my daughter's kid is, then there's kind of a legal problem there, right? So the way Christianity dealt with it was to say that you can't have a kid until you're married. That you probably shouldn't make it ambiguous as to who the father of your kid is. And so it's a good thing to abstain from promiscuity until marriage. Because when you're married, there's already a legal bond there. And so there's not a legal problem as to who inherits my land and my power and my wealth. Are we all on the same page still? Seth, can you give me a vibe check again? Yeah, yeah. We're all good. All good. Lots of, Sweet. Uh, fun, lots of uh, fun gifts going around. <laughs> okay, cool. So, big idea here, guys. <coughs> the Christian church said it's good to be married and to be monogamous. Because in the roots of the Christian church, in Judaism, in Roman law, um, your property goes to your firstborn son. And so is it a surprise to not make it hard to know who the father of your firstborn son is? I mean... We could go into detail about the morality of that and why uh, humans are kind of pre-programmed to like that and think that any alternative is bad. Um, that's a whole different discussion. I'm just here to talk about the history of maybe what caused it. Um, so please, don't be uh, offended or, or um, try to, I guess, feel as if I am making a blanket statement on behalf of all religion. I'm not. I'm just trying to give a historical example of why it might be useful to construct your religion like that. Kind of how you as a writer might need to make decisions as to whether your religion likes monogamy or polyamory. Whether your religion says that one husband can have many wives or one wife can have many husbands or one husband should have one wife. Those are decisions that you can make because you are making up your culture. But you have to justify them. Why is it useful to your religion to have one wife that has many husbands? Right? Maybe there were, maybe there were uh, for instance, a lot of bees. And bees were very um, uh, religiously held up because of the honey that they created. And they thought the honey was the gift of the gods. And so just like the bees, we had one which had one queen which mated with many males then maybe humans should do the same thing right um you guys kind of see where i'm going with this right you can justify decisions that interesting decisions you make in your culture by the material cause so let's let's keep going with this idea about um sexuality and christianity what happened after christianity decided that monogamy and getting married and abstaining from promiscuity in order to help property disputes be much simpler. Um, what happened next? Well, medieval Europe happened next. I mean, of course, not overnight, but um, in medieval Europe, let's think about how there were many, many different kings, many different kingdoms, many different um, 
uh, isolated groups of people who had armies that fought each other and defended each other against others and united under smaller kings and all of them warred with each other. That group of people in medieval Europe were pretty separate, all things considered. They kind of all hated each other. England hated France. Um, the Holy Roman Empire hated everyone else. Uh, the church um, uh, was its own state at the time, right? Spain, Portugal, the wars in Scotland and Wales and Ireland and England. Everyone pretty much hated each other. But what was the one common factor that linked them together? Well, it was Christianity. It linked very many ethnically and culturally diverse people by the power of the Catholic Church. Um, and so many of these quote-unquote Western um, nations evolved with the idea that Christian morals were the right way to act, Monog including monogamy, chastity, getting married, um, having your male inheritor right and it all ties back to roman and judaism um a law so and then now why is it in much of the world that um that's very commonly held belief well colonialism right uh europe justified much of its colonization by bringing civilization to quote-unquote uncivilized people including their morals their religion and their property laws. Even today, institutions and public schools, uh, schools teach abstinence as a form of sexual education. That's a thing. I mean, in America, it's for sure a thing. Right? So, and it all ties back to the idea that males inherit your wealth and power. And in order for you to know who exactly gets their wealth and power so you can train them to become more wealthy and more powerful than even you were, you should probably not be confused as to who the father was. That is the link between, the historical link between property rights and sexuality. You can see that it's a rabbit hole. It is a rabbit hole. It goes very deep and very wide and it questions a lot of the assumptions you had about why people act the way they act. There are millennia that go back where people have thought about similar things that we had. And what if their thinking was just slightly different? In your world, they can be. So in summary, property rights of the Roman Empire and Judaism were borrowed by Christianity. Christian morals were enforced upon the kings and cultures of medieval Europe. European colonization forced these Christian morals upon the quote-unquote modern Western world. And that's why the Western world tends to not, not talk openly about sexuality. It's taboo. It all traces back. And if you can do that with only several important things in your story, I mean, how much realer could it be? Right? Right? That is why historical materialism, I think, is so useful to a writer in world building. And I think that that example really, really um, showcases um, a lot about how many different things are linked. So you might ask then, what are some things that, that you can go into detail about, that, that you can imagine had its own crazy history that can be different, you know? It's really easy to take a culture in real life and juxtapose it into your story and kind of just leave it at that. But again, you want to change things here and there because part of the fun of world building a story is seeing what can be different from the real world. So what are those things that can be different? Well, let's, let's think about a couple things. Here are a bunch of examples. Economics. Import, export, and labor. What does your culture buy, sell, or create? What, did they, what kind of goods did they end up with, right? Uh, England pretty much colonized India and China, so it's happened to their spice and tea markets. Even today, a lot of the wealth is in the Middle East. The Middle East has oil. Oil is very important. So 
if you wonder why there are a lot of very rich Saudi Arabian princes, um, oil exists, right? Buy, sell, or create. What are the economics of your early people? Um, politics. We've talked about how religion could affect politics and how politics can affect religion. Who rules and why is everyone okay with that? Well, in real life, the reason is because kings rule because of religious justification and they act as a symbol of power and security to the common man. That person can do anything. And so if I listen to that person, then I might just be able to get anything as well. Um, that goes back to, I believe, Leviathan, Thomas Hobbes, right? Um, that's beside the point. Uh, and then inheritance. Inheritance is part of politics. Do men or women get first dibs on the property being passed down by prior generations? Some Asian and African cultures prefer females as inheritors, right? And surely that affects their politics. Surely that affects their religion. Surely that affects their legal system. Um, and is there a way that your culture can do that? Is there, what does that do for your characters? What do they believe as a result? Um, politics is something we can go very deep in. And again, we're just scratching the surface here. We're taking one tiny footstep into the idea of um, how to justify all of it. Um, next point is religion. Does religion connect or separate people within your society or within different societies? Uh, religion can be used by very many different people in very many different ways. You can see this uh, especially in a lot of the um, grand fantasy stories such as Dune, such as Game of Thrones. Lord of the Rings had a lot of religion in it. Um, and they were all used in different ways by different people. Uh, there were many religions in all those stories, right? Uh, in real life, the Crusades were called to unite Europe to cease monarchical infighting. Like I said, everyone in medieval Europe hated each other. Um, they all wanted to take each other's land. But the Crusades united Europe. They stopped taking each other's land because they all had to go to Jerusalem. And the Crusades pit everyone against the common enemy. And that's Islam, right? So the, the Pope was pretty much like, yo, all my Christian kings that keep killing each other, can you stop? Let's go kill people more different than us. And they went to Jerusalem and fought all the Islam, uh, Islamic uh, states there. Um, so that can be an example of how religion gets used in your story. You can see it gets used here both to connect and separate people in this example. Uh, it separates the Christians from the Muslims, and it, it unites all of the different Christian kingdoms that have different political identities under the same religious flag. Another idea that we can dive into with culture is connectedness or lack thereof. How isolated or how connected is your culture? And how does that affect how it grew up? Are there neighboring civilizations that they have similar properties uh, between each other? Islam shares theology with Christianity, which shares theology with Judaism, right? So the religions have a bit of a compatibility of ideals in some ways. Um, and who started these properties and how did it catch on? Uh, this can happen with other things like technology or culture or food even, right? Food is a big part of culture. Um, a technology that uh, was started in China, gunpowder, um, was weaponized by those who came to China looking for tea. And then they saw gunpowder and they're like, yo, what if we shoot people with this? So that works. Um, and then otherness. Otherness is another concept in culture that, uh, and society that uh, can go into a lot. Um, and the idea is who are unwelcome in society and why? A lot of places or a lot of times and eras in the world and societies where you just get ostracized. And why? Why would your culture ostracize someone? Who is unwelcome? Um, during the Cold War, if you were a politician uh, and you made an enemy, well, maybe you could get rid of your enemy by calling them a communist because the society hated communists. That's called McCarthyism. So that's something that you could use politically as well. 
Um, yeah. Uh, next, next slide is about tropes to avoid. Uh, these are tropes that I definitely think you should avoid. I think it goes without saying. Um, maybe you'll recognize some of them. So X is good and Y is bad. When you do a lot of in-depth world building like this, and you use historical example, and maybe some people might find uh, uh, reflections of their culture within your world, then it's hard to say that this group of people is just good, and this group of people is just bad. That's why grand fantasy and gray on gray morality go together hand in hand. Because if you... Um, if you don't, well, this happens, right? Uh, there's nothing wrong with black and white morality, morality, but keep in mind the implications of who you as an author are othering and why you are telling the reader to dislike a certain group. So be careful of that. Be very careful of that. Um, it's hard. It's hard when, when you know, perhaps someone in your audience might be part of the group that you use to model this fictional people and then you're just showing the fictional people as the bad bad guys who want nothing but the bad i don't know about that man i don't know about that be aware of this trope of the planet of funny hats uh, if you click the link it sends you to tv tropes page about it um a well world built society will inev inevitably have fundamental differences from historical ones real groups of people are never only defined by one shallow trait you go to a planet and everyone just wears funny hats, but other than that, they're normal people like in the real world. That's ridiculous. It just isn't believable. It completely takes any immersion or any work out of you, the author, and the audience um, to believe that this people can actually have been a people with their own history and cultures and values and religion and politics and economy. Um, every single person in the society will have their own motivations, personalities, and identities, and it's just a waste to create a society and give them all funny hats. And of course, the example of funny hats is a an exaggeration, but I mean, I've seen much um, much similar stuff in world building of some very famous places. I mean, how many times do you read an isekai? You go into a culture. Uh, and we're you're excited to learn about the world building, and everyone is just cat people, and they're just Japanese cat people. That's just the same thing as Planet of the Funny Hats, guys. That's just um, Planet of the Funny Mouth and Ears and Eyes. And it's Japan. And it's feudal Japan, right? Like, that's that's a thing. So please, be very careful of that trope. Next idea is Euro America <clears throat> and Asian centrism. Uh, just like you benefit in writing your story by drawing from many comparisons and many inspirations, the same is true for creating cultures. You can't really immerse your reader by telling them, uh, oh, this is just fantasy Japan. Or this is just fantasy America. This is just fantasy England. You need to make the reader want to learn more about the culture, not simply equate it to a pre existing historical one. Unless, I suppose, you're writing um, historical fiction, in which case that's kind of what they came there for. But, um, yeah, uh, be careful of just writing all of the cultures in your society as, oh, um, I mean, I'm from America, and in, Amer in, in California we think of uh, people from, from Washington like this, and we think of people from Arizona like this, so we're just going to make... California, Washington, and Arizona uh, cultures in my world and call it a day. No. Uh, it's much more interesting to not just centrally focus on a very specific world, a very specific people, because you lose the immersion that uh, people who are maybe not might be from that place might have. So try to start it from the beginning. Start it from the bottom. Uh, put some work into it. The last thing that really does get on my nerves, this trope is called technology hodgepodge. Technology is not important because it lets you do something new. Technology is important because it builds upon itself, fundam fundamentally creating new chains of inventions and ways to live. 
you, for example, you must justify why guns exist, but every soldier in any army is only armed with swords. That's kind of crazy, isn't it? Um, an example is Dune. Not, an ex not a bad example. A good example of justifying this is Dune. Because in Dune, they have guns. They have lasers. They have crazy stuff. Missiles. But something stronger than all of that is a personal shield. And this personal shield, when you turn it on, will deflect anything moving at high velocity and high energy. So in order to kill somebody who's got a personal shield, you got to slowly stab them. And so all the soldiers carry swords instead of guns. Great justification, right? Great, great world building, amazing. Um, but in your story, you need to keep in mind the fact that guns made armor obsolete and accurate guns made line formations obsolete. Faster shooting guns made horses obsolete. You can kind of see why. We don't have line formations and horses in modern combat. So I don't want to see a cavalry formation charge in a story where rifles exist. That just doesn't make sense. So please justify the differences you have from reality, especially in terms of technology. This happens all the time in terms of technology. Um, so maybe you'll benefit from doing some research into that. Uh, that's the end of the lecture. We can have a little bit of a Q&A maybe for like five or ten minutes um, after that. Uh, hopefully this was interesting for you guys. Um, I'll make sure to add everyone's new student role uh, when I close out this lecture. But that's pretty much it from today's talk. Um, hopefully it was interesting to you guys and appreciate everyone for coming. Please download the VoiceMe app. Um, subscribe on all of our socials such as TikTok, YouTube, and Twitter, and Facebook. Um, and thank you everyone for coming. Thank you, Seth, for helping host. And I will catch you guys next time. I'm going to turn off the stream. Thank you, everybody. All right. So, yeah, Q&A. I am now able to um, look at the chat. So how's everyone, how's everyone doing? Any questions? Um, boo, 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 boo. Anyone missing their, um, their role that needs to have it? Do, 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 do. Me, King Kuba, and Kid Kazri, I'll give you guys the role. Cool. Is there anywhere to relist it to this again? Uh, yeah, it's being. It was recorded, uh, Brandon. Progress. So you can go ahead and check out the stream on um, YouTube. It is counted as a live stream. I'm giving King Kuba and Kid Kazuri their roles. Enjoy your little ribbons. You cover a lot and didn't go too deep. I, I hope that's a compliment, Zuo. I, um, I feel like if I would have gone too deep into any of these one examples, we would have all just gotten lost in the sauce, if you know what I mean. Um, if I get a student role, would I be able to get my story on VoiceMe? Uh, maybe. Um, I won't say it's because of the student role, but maybe. <laughs> But yeah, um, please keep hitting me with questions or comments. I got to go very soon. So um, please, please do. Um, I'm going to prioritize questions and comments and clarifications and things such as that. Um, again, you can check out this lecture on the Class Assets channel. Um, I've linked the slide there. Uh, feel free to fact check me. I'm, you know, I don't particularly have all my sources in a row. Uh, on this, so don't take everything I'm saying at like pure historical word. But I mean, I I'm getting this from like like research and professors who have taught this idea, these ideas. So, uh, which time period is your favorite? It's a good question. I have a lot of favorite time periods. I'm a big fan of um, uh, ancient and classical civilizations. I love archaeology. It's a personal habit, uh, hobby of mine. Um, not that I go out and do archaeology, but but like watching other people do it. I love that. Um, so yeah, I love the classic, the classics. Um, 
oh no like would the student role hinder me no no no, no. the student role is just a fun thing to to get um for for doing a lot of or for coming to a lot of classes and enjoying them and uh, knowing that you participate in that way it's kind of like people see your student role and they're like oh that's awesome sort of thing i definitely do that Hoppy is the god of the Nile and the one who controlled the flooding, but you didn't mention him. I thought I did mention Hoppy. Hoppy um, uh, is the actually the one in the picture on, I think, page two of the slides. Yeah. Um, Kit Cosry says, I think this fits well with Brandon Sanderson's lectures on world building. Going deeper on a topic rather than wider gets at his historical materialist perspective. We are extrapolating, extrapolating from one idea oftentimes how it affects the world around it. Exactly. I, I, I completely agree. I've, I've listened to all of Brandon Sanderson's lectures on world building and I completely agree. Don't just try to add on, um, I guess, complexity. You don't create complexity and immersiveness in a, a society by just adding details on top of each other. It doesn't work like that. It stems from this notion that things have affected each other, that things logically lead to each other, right? So it's about going deeper. It's about creating layers to this onion like you're an ogre, right? So um, that is how um, complexity and immersion is reached by a society by imagining a history. You don't even have to tell the history. You just need to show that it's been thought of. Um, what would be some examples of good world building in fiction and more specific best world building in a manga or webtoon? Um, that is a really good question. I mean, there's a lot of them. I love, for example, I think in manga, um, one of my favorite aspects of world building, especially biological world building, is in Made in Abyss. I think Made in Abyss has amazing world building. Um, in in other, uh, some of my favorite world build stories actually happen to be things like video games. I think the Near Automata world has amazing world building. Um, one of my favorite video games is Hades, the roguelike game. Um, that has a world, that has a amazingly toned world or sorry an amazing tone to its world building even though the world itself is the world of greek mythology it has a very unique tone um avatar the last airbender again is an example excellent example for everything um in manga or in a webtoon um there it, it Honestly, the list goes on. I think that a lot of really popular manga has really solid world building, but the standout for me would have to be Made in Abyss. Um, yeah. Nier Automata is quite of an acid trip of a story. It's for sure true, yeah. Definitely true. Um, another one that I think has is like really interesting, I don't think the world building is super deep or super complex, but I think it is interesting, is... Um, uh, Fire Emblem Three Houses world building. It's very simplistic, but it is, again, it has a history of com complexity, of immersiveness, because um, it does trace a lot of the concepts that historically lead to revolution, um, which the story is about in, in Fire Emblem. Um, revolution. The Portal games also have good world building, definitely. Especially the Portal games um, specifically, I think, have and the Half-Life games have great execution of world building. They really tease you and bring up ideas that um, um, hint at further complexity and further detail in the history of these concepts. So um, even though the world itself might be pretty simple, that's an important skill to gain too. Are you... Uh, oh. Oh, no, Sorry, I, was, I was just saying I'm. Uh, I, I finally I've, I've returned. I'm. I'm back. Oh, welcome back. Yeah, um, yeah, I dipped out for a little bit there. Oh, that's fine. That's fine. Are you rating world building based on how it contributes to the narrative or the accuracy of the realism? I think that. I mean, I'm not specifically uh, hung up on the realism of world building, but I think that. Um, I think that the contribution to the narrative is in a lot of ways, immersion, motivation, and context of your narrative itself. So I think both ways, um, I think it's both. 
Um, uh, for yeah. world building, uh, I'd recommend Full Metal Alchemist and Overlord as a two series that I would recommend. Those two are fantastic as well, for sure. But yeah, guys, um, I do have to go right now, so please continue your discussion. Um, if you, I, I believe the chat room might close out when I close out the um, stage, so if you guys want to continue this discussion, feel free to do so either in um, general or say like literature chat because we are talking about you know specifically the I'm, literature I'm, I'm of world. Sure, I'm pretty sure the class stage chat still remains even if you close the event. I'm oh, sure. that's good. That's fantastic. Then you guys can keep talking here. Um, so yeah, let's. Uh, I'm gonna call it here. Thank you everyone so much for coming. I hope you guys enjoy the rest of your day. I hope that you guys. Um, have gotten your creative juices flowing by talking about some world building and I uh, and hopefully my method was helpful to you guys in such that it helps you think about history and pull from uh, be inspired by history oh, excuse me. there's a motorcycle inside in ways that are captivating um, and in ways that that you know professionals doctors uh, PhDs and masters uh, use to consider how the real world was built so for sure it'll work in a story.